and welcome to our Ask the Expert event. I'm WCRB morning host, Laura Carlo, and your host for this afternoon's virtual event. It's titled Ask the Experts, Holiday Inspired by Julia Child. Today, we're connecting with Jacques Pepin and Alex Prudhomme. And a special thank you to everyone who has joined us today, including our Beacon Circle and Champion Circle members. We appreciate your continued generous support. This event is brought to you by Walden Local Meat. We thank them for their support. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that, unlike us, you will not be on video. We cannot hear you, we cannot see you, but we do want to hear from you. If you have a question for our experts, you can open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type your questions in there. And let us know where you're listening from too. It's always fun for us to know. And if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, then be sure to give it a thumbs up and we'll focus on the most popular questions featured in the Q&A tab. Now to turn on closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options are going to open up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be a little bit delayed. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jacques Pepin. He is the winner of 16 James Beard Awards and a Daytime Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award. He's the author of over 30 cookbooks, including his latest, The Art of the Chicken. He has starred in 12 PBS cooking series. He was awarded France's highest honor, the Legion of Honor. Jacques' dedication to culinary education led him to create the Jacques Pepin Foundation in 2016. And I've got to say, Jacques Pepin, I am your biggest fangirl. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex Prudhomme is Julia Child's great nephew and the co-author of her memoir, My Life in France, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and inspired half of the film, Julie and Julia. Alex has written nine books, including three about Julia and Paul Child, The French Chef in America, France is a Feast, and Born Hungry, which a title I adore. His newest book, Dinner with the President, Food, Politics, and the History of Breaking Bread at the White House is going to be published by Alfred A. Knopf in February of 2023. Welcome to you both. I'm going to ask Jacques Pepin and Alex Prudhomme a couple of questions, and then they'll begin uh, to answer your questions as well. And again, go to the Q&A tab uh, to ask your questions. Jacques, we know that Julia wasn't French, and maybe that's not a prerequisite for someone championing a particular cuisine, but what did you think of her French recipes? Well, to tell you the truth, when we did our series together, we got many, many letters from people who look at the show and who thought she was much more French than I was. <laughs> <laughs> and. Probably true. She always said that we started cooking together to a certain extent. It was true. I was in apprenticeship in 1949, a long, long time ago. And she went to France about at that time to live there a couple of years. So the style of cooking at the time is what she had and what I had when I was in apprenticeship. So we, to a certain extent, yes, yeah, started cooking together in a style. But uh, we had a great time arguing all the time, but we had a great time cooking together. <laughs> Hard to believe that that you would argue over food. Oh, yes, true. <laughs> and wine. Alex, Julia was honored with so many different distinctions. Uh, a butter, of course, a butter-colored rose, 
named the Julia Child. Uh, in 2014, the U.S. Postal Service issued the Celebrity Chef's Forever Stamps and included her in that. What would she say about these things? Um, did she like that kind of publicity or would she say it's just too much fuss? Um, well, Julia always called herself a ham. Uh, she liked to perform. She didn't take herself all that seriously as a celebrity, uh, but she took her cooking very seriously, as Jacques can tell you, um, and uh, was really dedicated uh, as a teacher. Uh, she really saw herself as a teacher and a student. She called herself an eternal pupil. Um, so I think she enjoyed those sorts of things. I mean, she was a rose lover and she actually picked out that particular rose uh, to be named after herself. And, uh, you know, I think the postage stamp thing, I think she would have a chuckle about that. Um, I think more importantly, uh, I think she would love to see that, uh, you know, she died in 2004 and here we are in 2022 and we're still talking about her. Uh, she's still very much in the ether. Uh, her influence is still felt, her recipes still work. Uh, and her teaching uh, continues. And so I think that that legacy would give her great pleasure. It's nice to hear. All right, so this is a question for both of you. Did you know if Julia had any guilty pleasures in food, uh, maybe fast food or prepackaged food? We want the inside scoop. <laughs> well, I can tell you that I don't think she did. Uh, we talked about from hamburger to french fry to anything. I don't think she had any any guilty pleasure. If she likes something, she hates it without any, uh, you know, without any excuses or whatever. And uh, I am basically the same way too. You know, I, I don't really have any guilty pleasure. If I have cookie or whatever it may be, if it's there, I eat it, uh, you know, uh, without, I, I don't think there is any food which is wrong to a certain extent, you know, if you like it. So, yeah, but I don't know. What do you think, Alex? <laughs> I completely agree. You know, the word guilt is kind of loaded. Uh, she didn't have guilt. Uh, she said as long as it tasted good, that was what she was all about. Yeah. Um, she would sometimes be provocative and she would say things like, oh, you know, health food is like bird food. People can't survive on that. We know more butter, more cream. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she loved a good hamburger. We had many hamburgers together. Uh, and she would go and have a cheap hot dog sometimes. Um, she wasn't snobby about food as Jacques is the same way and so am I um at the same time uh, both Julia and Jacques appreciate really fine food uh and, and a good glass of wine and um so uh don't think she had guilty pleasures uh but she certainly liked a chocolate dipped strawberry uh you know a bit of caviar a glass of champagne so um she was a food lover, not a food guilter. All right, so let's go to some of our questions then from our, our uh, listeners and uh, viewers today. Uh, Ran Sharon from Brooklyn, New York is with us and has asked if Alex, you've ever seen the Bon Appetit one woman opera about Julia, Jean Stapleton premiered it. That's right, yeah, I have seen it uh, and it's really fun. And uh, for those who don't know about this, um, they took an episode of The French Chef, Julia's original television show, uh, about making a chocolate cake. And they literally took the transcript of that and turned it into an opera. And so when the singer performs this one act opera, she is uh, playing the role of Julia as if she were on a television show making a cake, but she's singing it, singing the recipe um, and covering herself in flour and a smear of chocolate. And, um, and then uh, at the end, she bakes the cake and presents pieces to the audience. So it's, it's a really fun show. Um, and in fact, my cousin, Julia Child Prudhomme, who lives in um, Seattle, uh, is part of a production that that just concluded out there, but um, it's a it's a show that is performed across the country, um, you know, sort of nonstop, and it's and it's really fun. That's great. Well, I hope it comes to Boston. I'd love to see it. Uh, we have a uh, Zoom user, no name, uh, who is asking if you can recommend an appetizer to serve during the upcoming holidays. 
Well, uh, uh, <clears throat> there is hundreds of appetizers that you serve. <laughs> Basically, for me, you follow the season. Whatever is in season <clears throat> is going to be the cheapest that you can buy, the best in terms of taste, and probably the more nutritious. So yes, follow the season and follow your taste. You like this, you don't like that. I go to the market also, and uh, you know, um, I plan to do duck, and uh, I see they have chicken two for one. I change my mind and I buy a chicken two for one. So, so yeah, <clears throat> you gotta follow your taste, follow what's in season. And follow the taste of your guest, whoever you invite. I mean, to invite people in your house is really to please them. This is the ultimate goal, you know. So if you try to find out a little bit before they come what they like or maybe what they don't like so that you don't uh, give them and they will eat it uh, out of guilt. But uh, yeah, that, that's what I do myself. So. Uh, we have a uh, listener from... Brookline, Massachusetts, wants to say thank you to Jacques and Alex for joining us today and would love to hear uh, pros and cons of pastry crusts, all butter, butter and lard, butter and shortening, etc. Do you have a favorite? Did Julia have a favorite? Also, um, talking about pie, because this is pie season now, uh, glass versus metal pie pans, and um, uh, she says, I have seen comments about freezing pastry crust ahead of time and then using that, but I don't know what do you do when you take it out of the freezer. So three and one, all about pies. Okay. You want to take that one or you want me to talk about no, it? Jacques, you're the chef. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think there is any, any rule there. I mean, I've done certainly with Julia, <clears throat> butter and more butter. So... Uh, to a certain extent. I remember one time we did a show together and uh, we had no recipe. So at the last moment we could change and so forth. And on that day, we're doing an apple gallet. So uh, we tell the cameraman, okay, Jacques is gonna start with the apple gallet doing the dough and so forth. And Julia say, all right, so that's great. And then just before we started, she said, oh, I wanna do my own dough too. What? I said, yeah, that's a great idea. So fine, so I started did an apple gallet, so it was a butter, just a butter um, uh, dough, you know, with, with a little bit of water. I rolled it, she helped me cut the apple, put it on top, we put it into the oven. And I said, okay, now Julia is gonna show you another dough. And she said, well, Jacques is gonna do it. I said, oh, okay, fine. <laughs> and she said, and I want you to use the food processor. I said, no, that's a good idea, people use the food processor. So, uh, I put like a cup and a half of flour in there. I said, how much butter do you want? She said, uh, half a stick or whatever. I said, is that enough? She said, well, I want to put some lard in there. I said, okay. So uh, we put some lard in there and uh, she rolled the dough. I helped her, we did the reverse of what we've done. So basically, you know, one or the other works, but basically she would usually use butter. I mean, butter, probably more butter than I use myself. So. And she had no, certainly no guilt about uh, in the, when we did the uh, butter. And I remember sometimes someone say, you use too much butter. Say, you don't want to use it, then put heavy cream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, <laughs> yeah, if you don't like butter, use cream. That was her big line. Um, she loved pies. Um, I remember as a kid, uh, we would spend some time together in the summers up in Maine, and we would always pick blueberries or blackberries, or raspberries, and we would make pies. And... She just loved to, you know, get everybody working together in the kitchen. It was nothing more fun. And we would all be covered with flour and berries and everything else. And, um, you know, it was just, she made it fun. And even the cleaning up, she made fun. Um, and, you know, here we are in Thanksgiving season. Uh, this was sort of our family's favorite holiday because uh, for us, it was really about food and family and eating and and talking and laughing and telling silly jokes. And um, it was sort of a, uh, a friendly competition. Uh, you know, Julia would often do the turkey. Um, and then the rest of us would chime in with, you know, esoteric versions of stuffing and, you know, side dishes like, you know, parsnips or uh, one year I did a chestnut puree, uh, which ruined my thumbs. I'll never forget that. And um uh, you know, uh, trying new things and and the, the the meal would sort of be an epic uh, event that would go on for hours and we'd all pass out. 
uh, and, and it was just really fun. And so uh, this time of year is uh, it, it is wonderful for food. And um, I'll just say a quick aside, which is that when Julia and Paul were living in Paris in the late 40s and early 50s, there was no Thanksgiving. And so they made their own. And, and Julia loved the fresh game that came in at this time of year. She you know, would try cooking venison uh, and wild boar, um, but she particularly loved birds. Uh, things like, you know, duck. She loved duck uh, and experimented to the point where she um, uh, made herself sick. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she learned about cooking things like partridge, uh, which she'd never had before. And so when you read about this and you talk to her about it, it, it you see this questing intelligence. She was always asking questions and, and wondering what next and how do I do this and, um, and just having a lot of fun with it. And so I think this particular time of year was one of her favorites food-wise. Yeah, it is for a lot of us. Uh, Jacques, um, what, do you, what do you say about um, freezing pastry crust ahead of time? People do want to have those little tricks so that they can get caught up before the holidays, but we never know what to do with it once they're frozen. Yes, well, I would add to Alex first that yes, certainly the season, the fall season in France is great. I mean, uh, wild mushroom, you will pick up a lot of wild mushroom, partridge, woodcock, squab, uh, different type, and all of the, the, the fall vegetables. So it's a great, certainly the great season and uh, for game and so forth. Well, for your pastry uh, dough, I'll tell you, I do a dough, I take the food processor, I put a cup, a couple of cups of uh, flour in it, like uh, a stick and a half of very cold butter in the little dice I cut in it, and I process about 10, 12 seconds, add half a cup of water to it, process it another five, six, seven seconds. The whole thing is not even gathered together, then I put it on the counter, press it together into a dough, I roll the dough, at that point, right away, and I use it right away. I don't even let it rest. So it's much easier than having the dough to defrost for overnight and all that. So, but you can certainly freeze your dough, have it defrosted overnight, and uh, or a few hours at least, and preferably defrost it under refrigeration, and um, and roll it. But for me, it's not more complicated than doing the dough, taking it and rolling it. Uh, I don't have to let it rest in between because. I process this such a minimal amount of time that it doesn't develop the gluten in the flour. So it does so the elastic, it can be raw right away. You know? So it's a question of choice. Yeah. Yes. I'll just add that my wife has become a dough master and uh, she likes to freeze hers overnight. Uh, she believes that it it helps it, uh, the gluten as, as Jacques was alluding to. And um, so um, I'm not sure what kind of pie she's making for this Thanksgiving, but it, it's always... Uh, a production uh, that takes over the kitchen and, and, it, and it makes the house smell good. Always. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we've mentioned her love of butter <laughs> many times. Um, and um, I read online that she used to like to use French butter. And that's not something that we find in our local grocery stores necessarily. I mean, sometimes we find Irish butter uh, and local butter, but nothing that is identifiable as French. So is that important uh, to using her recipes? Well, I, uh, I find French butter in my uh, stop and shop. <laughs> so, but I find Irish butter too. And frankly, to tell you the truth, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, uh, you didn't have access to the type of butter that we have now. And uh, at that time, uh, often, even in the supermarket, you only had salted butter. And usually we use unsalted butter. You know, unsalted butter, very often, they keep it frozen. Because uh, if it lasts too long there, it starts getting yellow and you know it whole. Because the salt doesn't preserve it. The salted butter is preserved by the salt. It can stay much longer here, even though it's going to be older than the, the fresh one. So I personally use only unsalted butter. If I want salt in it or sugar, I can add it. But I think that now there is some very, very good butter from Vermont, from all over the country that we didn't have like 20, 25 years ago. So I think that Julia would taste the butter and if she likes it, whether it's French or from California or Vermont, she would use it. <laughs> 
Okay. I would uh, also add to that that um, Julia loved the French butters because there were so many distinct types uh, and she would compare them. Uh, some had more salt, some had less, some had uh, a, a little sweetness to them and, and they kind of reflected the terroir of where they were from. Um, and I would add to Jacques that, uh, you know, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and in the little local specialty shop, they have several different types of French butter. Um, but to answer the question, I don't think it matters that you have French butter per se, as long as it's a good butter um, and you sort of taste it beforehand and know what you're getting. Um, and, and, and I think that the, 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 the food system has now become sophisticated enough and there's enough of an audience that you really can find excellent butter at, at your local grocery store. Yes, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Karen from Wellesley is asking what kitchen element, uh, implement, sorry, would Julia say would be absolutely essential for all our kitchens? Well, your finger to start with. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Use your hands. Yeah. Well, you know, she was always famous on the show for using what she called the fright knife, which was a giant, uh, you know, butcher's knife or a big giant rolling pin, which she used to, uh, to whack, uh, you know, a piece of meat to tenderize it uh, or a piece of dough. Um, and she loved that kind of prop. Um, but, you know, there are humbler. I mean, she loved little little paring knives uh, uh, that, that she would keep razor sharp. Um, and uh, something like a, a, a pair of kitchen shears can be very useful uh, or scissors rather uh, that, that can be used in many different ways. Things that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, and then, of course, if you ever visit her kitchen on display at the Smithsonian's uh, National Museum of American History, you will see her actual kitchen from Cambridge, and you can see all of the implements she had. Um, she called herself a gadget freak, and she was not able to go to Paris without bringing, uh, as Paul said, um, enough equipment back that could outfit a small restaurant uh, kitchen. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, anything that had to do with cooking, uh, she was an early adopter uh, and an enthusiast. All right, uh, we have a question from uh, Jennifer, doesn't say where she's from. Uh, what would Julia say her most challenging recipe or her most challenging ingredient to use was? Hmm. I don't know, do you know about the, I, Well, she uh, she had battles with various ingredients. I can think of two right off the top of my head. Uh, she loved potatoes, but she called them tricky little busters because <laughs> uh, they're deceptively hard to get right uh, the way she liked them. Um, similarly, she thought of... Uh, she would always a judge, uh, and she wasn't a judgy person, but she would um, she would judge other cooks by the way they did a roast chicken, which is a seemingly simple dish, uh, but to get it just right uh, and to taste very chickeny, as she would say, uh, is not that easy, and it takes a lot of skill and, and, and attention to detail. And a third one actually um, is apples. Apples, uh, uh, various. Uh, degrees of sweetness or tartness, uh, hardness, you know, they cook differently. Uh, one of my favorite episodes of The French Chef is when Julia does a tarte tatin, which is a, a beautiful caramelized dome of, of apple uh, that you, it is quite dramatic. You cook it in a frying pan and then you unmold it on a plate. But in this particular episode, which you could probably find online, uh, Julia uh, brings it out of the oven and flips it over and says, ta-da, and she lifts the, the pan. And what she has is not a beautiful caramelized dome, but a pile of brown mush. Uh, and she said, oh, well, I, they must have given me the wrong apples in the market. And then she says, but well, here's how you can save it and show your friends that you're a good cook. And she sprinkles a little confectioner sugar over it and runs it under the broiler. And she says, oh, it'll, it'll taste better this way, um, which is kind of classic Julia <laughs> turning... Uh, lemons into lemonade or mushy apples into a, a, a fun dessert. And it's a, it was a teachable moment. So those are three things I can think of off the top of my head. And, the, and there's such common ingredients too, you know. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't think of apples or roast chicken as being that challenging, but for those who know, they are. Jan is with us from Cape Cod. 
and says, greetings. I have two grandsons aged eight and 10 who love to bake. They are adventurous eaters. Could you suggest a dessert recipe that they could prepare that would be foolproof, fun, and easy to encourage the boys to continue their interest in baking? Well, well I would uh, say the tart is actually a great dish. It's a real crowd pleaser. It's not that hard. Make sure you get the right apples. Look at Julia's recipe carefully. Um, but it's really fun and it's really good. And, and uh, I think if the two of them did it together, they'd have a lot of fun with it. Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. You could use red or golden delicious. Uh, don't, uh, you know, don't use certain type of apple fall apart in, in um, you know, fast. Uh, I, uh, you know, very easy recipe. I did a recipe not too long ago with my granddaughter who came to my house and uh, she wanted cookie. I didn't have any cookie. I said, all right, fine. I had some white bread. Uh, I covered the white bread with butter on each side. And I put a plate with sugar and a bit of cinnamon in there, dip it on each side in there, and trim it and uh, cut it into strip uh, and put it into the oven for 10, 15 minutes. She said one of the best cookies she ever had. <laughs> That's great. Uh, question from Catherine, who wants to know, did Julia ever watch Saturday Night Live with the Dan Aykroyd character and the chicken? Well, that's a very appropriate question for this time of year. And, and uh, Jacques, let me, I'll, I'll start the story and you can finish it. But uh, Jacques and Julia were performing on the Tomorrow Show. I think it was called, uh, hosted by Tom Snyder. Uh, back in 1978, I think it was, yeah, exactly. and um, they were going to demonstrate um, not a turkey, but a, 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 a poulet demi saucé. I think it was called, right? Um, and then I'll let you take the story from here. Um, yeah, because uh, Tom Snyder, I had been, uh, yeah, I had been on his show in New York, and then he moved to Los Angeles. And he called me, he said, can you come on with the show with Julia? I said, yeah, I think I'd, she'd love it. And at that time, Julia was on the West Coast. In Vegas. So I was doing a book tour. So she said, oh, I'll take care of the food. So she bought enough food for probably 100 people. <laughs> Put it on the counter because he said, you don't have to have recipe, just cook and we'll have fun for like an hour and a half. So I was doing a book tour and I had a little knife, a little paring knife that she had in my pocket at that time, you could take that on the plane because I would go from one station to another and they say, you have 30 seconds, do something. So I take a tomato to do a rose or whatever with my knife. So they picked me up at the airport and they had to push the show already an hour because, uh, because my, my, my plane was not uh, on time. So they picked me up, we rushed to the studio, uh, put me through makeup. We came on stage with Tom Snyder and Julia five minutes before we start. I put my knife on the table. She took it to peel a shallot and cut the end of her finger off. I mean, there was, you know, a pretty bad cut. So I pushed it back together and, uh, and tightened a towel around it. And she was mad. She was mad at herself and she told Tom, Neither, I don't want to talk about it. Okay, fine. I mean, Jacques is going to cook. I'm going to taste. We have a good time. I don't want to talk about that. All right. We started the show. I remember Julia was in the middle, and Tom Snyder is like six, seven, something like that. And Julia said, Are we by order of size there? He said, Yes. How tall are you? She said, Six, two. And they look at me. I said, well, I'm a hobbit. I'm five, one, or whatever. <laughs> that was the first thing of the show, the second thing was Tom Snyder, he said, Julia, do you mind if I tell people you cut your finger? So of course the camera went onto her finger and, uh, and that's it. I remember she was on the, on the Johnny Carson show uh, two days later and all they talked about was her finger. A few days later, I was with her in, uh, in San Francisco on the, uh, what was that show? Uh, Anyway, a big show too, and we were supposed to do omelet to omelet, head to head, and we ended up talking about our finger all the time. And finally, Don Ackroy did uh, that take up on uh, on Saturday Night Live, but she liked it. She liked it. She I can just end it. the story. So uh, Dan Ackroyd, uh, who I interviewed about this uh, for my book, The French Chef in America, uh, told me that uh, he was a huge Julia fan, and and uh, so he would rush back from SNL rehearsals 
to watch the French chef and he saw the show uh, that, and, and he was a, he used to spoof uh, Tom Snyder all the time too, who was easy to spoof. Um, and he, uh, he and Al Franken got together and wrote a skit based on uh, what they saw with Julia at her damaged finger. And, and of course it becomes this bloody kind of horror show Thanksgiving, you know, save the liver. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes at the end of a dinner party, uh, late at night, after a lot to eat and drink, Julia would say, save the liver. Uh, so I think the answer to your question is that she, she appreciated it and, and thought it was funny. You know, as I said earlier, she, she took her cooking very seriously, but not herself. And as long as the humor was in, in the good spirit uh, uh, and sort of appreciative of her, uh, she was all for it. Um, and so, uh, yeah, she would actually, she kept a copy of the videotape of that, of that episode um, on top of her television in Cambridge. So she liked it. <laughs> all right. So we have a question from Kim who asks, what kind of wine did Julia like to drink with Thanksgiving turkey? And also, Jacques, what kind of wine do you prefer with turkey? Uh, I like free wine. <laughs> <laughs> you bring wine to my house, I'll drink it. You know, Jacques always says, I like the wine that's in front of me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, frankly, I like Côte du Rhône, uh, stuff, wine like that, uh, you know, but uh, frankly, most wine are, are going to be fine with me. And I, I think with Julia, we did a pretty good job with our wine when we were doing our show. Uh, it was, you know, we had a lot of wine. We had Kendall Jackson was one of the sponsors, but they had like 20, 25 different winery. And in addition to that, Jess Jackson was very generous because he said, yeah, you can have French wine, Italian, anything you want, I don't care. And that's what we did. We are the wine from basically all over the world, you know? Yeah, Julia, so Paul Child was a real uh, enophile, a real wine expert. And um, he generally at Thanksgiving, he would bring up, we would start with something a little lighter, like a Pinot Noir, and then work our way into the Cote du Rhone uh, as the night went on. And... Um, uh, you know, they 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 took their wine seriously, and in fact, uh, in the original mastering the art of French cooking, uh, Julia included a wine tutorial because when that book came out in 1961, Americans didn't really know that much about wine. They knew about two buck chuck and stuff like that, but um, it was a real tutorial uh, and explaining how the French see wine as a part of the meal. Uh, and that there are differences in the wines and how you pair them with the food. And it was really written by Paul. Um, and so uh, I, I was lucky to have Thanksgiving with them and, and get little tutorials. Uh, and um, it, it just made it fun. It was another um, aspect of the meal. Well, we have so many great questions uh, from our audience. And we want to say thank you for the questions we've already asked. We're going to get to more in just a second. I would like to take a moment now to introduce you to my colleague, Liz Lavoie. Welcome, Liz. Hi, I'm Liz from GBH's Member Engagement Department. Thank you all so much for being with us today as we celebrate all things Julia. It's wonderful to have you here along with our very special guests, Chef Jacques and Alex, as they answer all of our Julia-inspired questions. GBH launched the French Chef television series in 1963, and since then, Julia's talents have inspired cooks of all abilities. Help us to continue creating culinary programming that educates and entertains by donating to GBH today. Member Supports allows GBH to generate impactful cultural programming that you know and love. Today, if you are able to give $6.25 a month as a GBH sustainer or make a one-time gift of $75, we will be sending you Alex Perdome's Born Hungry, Julia Child Becomes the French Chef, and it's going to be a signed version. This beautiful and informative book shares Julia's passion for cooking and her enduring legacy through beautiful illustrations. It's made for the whole family, so whether you're gifting it for yourself in your own personal collection or gifting it to a loved one in this upcoming holiday season, you won't want to miss it. You'll find this book along with some other Julia-inspired gifts at our website, gbh.org support events. 
You can also text the keyword GBH to 800-204-3811, or you can scan this QR code right here to bring the donation form right up on your phone. All this information will be in our chat tab now, so check it out there. Donating will take just a few moments of your time and a few dollars on your credit card. These precious minutes turn in, turns into hundreds of hours of informative cultural programming. If you are already a member, we thank you so much for your support and for being here today. I'll now pass it back over to Laura. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Liz. And I uh, just want to echo what Liz said. Thank you so much for being uh, not just listeners to the radio station and viewers to our TV station, but also active members of our official family. That means the world to us. All right, let's get back to more of our questions. Um, Marisa is with us listening from Somerville, Massachusetts, and she asks Jacques, why is the baguette so much better in France? Is it the water? And she says, thank you for your, for your answer. But the, the water has a great deal to do with it, too. But I have to say that uh, I have place, even where I go in Connecticut, where the baguette is just as good as it is in France. It has changed a great deal now. People are more knowledgeable about the type of flour to use, the amount of gluten in the flour, the water, and so forth. So we, this is new, I mean, new in the last 10, 15 years or so forth. But before, you know, you couldn't get the quality of the baguette that you, you get. Certainly in France, you have it all over the place here. You have to look for it to find a really good baguette. Uh, I would want to ask, a uh, to add a little bit to what Alex said about certainly the wine. Uh, I've been to, uh, you know, Julia's and Paul's house many, many times, and I always have had incredible, especially the, uh, you know, the Burgundy wine, he had some great Burgundy wine. I remember the Vendron Manet and some other that he had, uh, which were, it was quite, he was quite knowledgeable with wine. He was also a very good painter, you know, and uh, painting, he had, the, and, and a terrific photographer, of course. Yeah, we had a good time with him. My wife yeah. loved him, which time we go there, he made a special cocktail <laughs> of wine. <laughs> Nice. Um, Cindy is with us from Wayland, Massachusetts, and she says she will fight with me to be Jacques Pepin's hugest fan. Oh. <laughs> and she has a question for you, Jacques. Uh, she says, I, I do remember that you and Julia would have friendly disagreements on quantities of butter and quantities of garlic to use in a recipe. It's true. You know, when you do television show, and I did you know, 12 series of 26 shows, so that's hundreds and hundreds of shows. Uh, I remember at KQED, uh, PBS station in San Francisco, when we started, they told me you have to do it on time because timing is too expensive. I mean, uh, you know, uh, to go, run over time. Then I did a series with my daughter. At when we started, I said, you know, Claudine, my daughter, is going to be the, the book popular, you know, asking me questions people would want to ask. I'm showing her how to make a, a dough. And I have the sign in front of me, someone going on set, five minutes, seven minutes, or three minutes to wrap up. And the kid is rolling the dough. So I have to push her over and grab the thing and do it myself to go faster. So that was one of the problems uh, that we had. When we did the show with Julia, people don't realize, first, we didn't have any recipe. So we could do whatever we wanted. Why do I have scallion in that recipe? Because they happen to be on the table, we throw them in. We had a lot of wine. And the third thing, Julia said, we're going to cook. When it finished, we'll tell you. Some of the show went to like 80 minutes, you know. And in fact, I was asking the, the, the producer, but we cannot find it, where all of those B-roll are, the extra material, because we had so much of it. So, you know, we had a great time doing those shows because no time, no time restaurant, a lot of wine, and no recipe, we could do whatever we wanted. So I think people felt it in that sense, that there was that kind of a, Fun and freedom, you know. So. I actually think that the the book and the tel television series that you two did together was was one of Julia's most successful because uh, b both Paul, uh, both Jacques and and uh, Julia were uh, strong minded, uh, had definite preferences and non preferences. I remember there was a big battle over black pepper versus 
white pepper. Uh, <laughs> What's the of a regular salt? <laughs> yeah, salt and pepper was a big battle. Um, but it made for uh, it made it was for, it was very instructional and educational uh, because it shows you that there's not necessarily one right way to do even a hamburger. Uh, uh, you know, Jacques' hamburger was actually more American, and yeah. Julia's hamburger was more French. Uh, and it, it's really kind of fun to, to read or to watch the two of them um, kind of hash it out. And um, there was a sort of a, I would almost call it a creative tension between the two of them where they are um, expressing their own uh, creativity and, and, and interests, um, uh, but towards the same goal. And um, so if you haven't seen that book or watched that series, I recommend it highly. Yeah, oh. we, we had a great time uh, together because of that, without any question. And I learned from Julia, how she said, this is television, you know, it's entertainment, you have to relax, but relax my, which I learned, you know, from her too. But uh, that being said, at the end of each of the show, she would say, what did we teach today? And again, going back to the teaching process, she wanted always to teach this or that. So it's true, yeah. It was a real buddy comedy, actually. I mean, Julia would call Jacques, hey, Jack, hey, Jack, why don't you do it this way? <laughs> and uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the high wire act was quite interesting because uh, the television is, a, is not as simple medium um, uh, as, as you guys know. And um, the fact that you two cooked without recipes, it's, it was a real high wire and um, and yet, um, it, it really worked, um, and um, it, it, it took you into interesting directions. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the two different ways of, of doing something as simple as the burger, as I said, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, because that's a little bit like you do with a friend, a dear friend, or with your spouse at home. When mm -hmm. you're out in your kitchen, you, know, you don't follow a recipe, you talk about it too, and uh, argue or whatever. So it was that type of... Uh, yeah, we had a good time. Yeah, Jacques would say, well, you know, we should make this dish healthy. And Julia would say, oh, we, we don't care if it's healthy. How does it taste, Jacques? <laughs> That's all I care about is the taste. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions about the foods that are coming up on Thanksgiving. Uh, one from Wendy, how can you keep blueberry pie filling from getting too watery? And the other is about uh, any professional tips on making mashed potatoes for the holiday. <laughs> blueberry pie filling and mashed potatoes. Well, the blueberry pie filling, you know, you always put a bit of starch in your blueberry, you know, I mean, the mixture and all that with sugar too. But there is nothing wrong. It depends on the berry too, time of the year, how ripe they are and so forth. But uh, there is nothing wrong with the, the berry running and so forth. It's much better than putting too much starch and having something gooey and more elastic. I don't really care if it runs, uh, you know, uh, you serve that with a bit of whipped cream, uh, uh, so that's perfectly fine. And I mean, for me, uh, certainly, uh, and the second question was about, uh, about what again? The mashed potato. Oh, the mashed potato. Oh, yeah, the mashed potato butter in it. You know, again, mashed potato. I put a couple of clove of garlic always in my mashed potato. Not too much water because I want to use the water of the mashed potato uh, to to uh, to crush it with and a fair amount of butter. And when it's done, maybe a little bit of milk, but not that much. Uh, but uh, when it finished, I crush it to make a puree out of it. And then use a whisk you know, for, uh, for 20 or 30 seconds to kind of emulsify it, make it more fluffy and elastic. We call it a, a pomme muslin, you know, like a mousse potato. And uh, yes, mashed potato is great. I mean, you can use the leftover, you know, you mix a couple of eggs in it and some cheese and a bit of cream and you do a beautiful gratin, you know. So uh, yeah, mashed potato is a big thing for me. At uh, I do mashed potato and mashed sweet potato as well. And we did it with Julia too. We, we always add uh, garlic and a little parsley and, or sometimes some chives in ours. Um, so uh, that's not to everybody's taste, but that um, I like that little bit because because potatoes um, have a great base flavor that, um, you know, it, it kind of goes in layers in a way almost. Um, and if you add a little bit of garlic, a lot of butter uh, and some herbs, it, I, I think it, it really just makes it 
uh, au point. Yep. <laughs> All right, so Leanne wants to know, what advice would Julia give for someone to be a good Thanksgiving guest? Should you offer to help in the kitchen? What house gift should you bring? Should you bring flowers or food? Or should you offer to help clean up? That's for you. Okay. Um, yeah, well, all of the above. Uh, what sort of house guests? Well, uh, Julia, you wouldn't have the opportunity to offer to help. You would walk in the door and Julia would immediately put you to work. Uh, she would say, you know, you uh, wash the lettuce and you dice the butter and you go downstairs in the cellar with Paul and help pick out the wine. Um, it was a group effort. Um, you were never quite sure who was going to show up. So, uh, you know, uh, come with uh, some conversation because uh, it could be some stranger that she met at the gas station, literally, um, or a famous chef sitting next to you or, and then the family members uh, in a kind of free for all. Um, and uh, in terms of a gift, uh, a bottle of wine, a, a good bottle of wine, I think, was always the right thing to bring, um, and um, and a willingness to participate and have fun. I like that. People were often intimidated by Julia, but you know, she the person you saw on television was the real Julia. She was very down to earth, and she wasn't um, snobby at all. Um, as I said, she liked being a celebrity, but she didn't take it that seriously. Uh, what she was really about was uh, cooking and eating together uh, and enjoying each other's company. And it was a very human approach to, to living life. Yeah, I would, I would agree totally with that. I mean, many, many times people have asked me, how was Julia in real life? Exactly the way she was on television, as you said. You no, know, no, she did enjoy life here. Yeah. One of my favorite memories of Julia at Thanksgiving uh, was visiting uh, the Childs in, in Cambridge. And they actually left their phone number in the phone book. Um, and so, uh, you know, starting the day before Thanksgiving, the phone would start ringing. And uh, it was sometimes it was friends, but more often it was stressed out people uh, cooking their turkey or attempting to cook their turkey, which would, you know, be kind of uh, half frozen and half burnt, and they would call up and say, Julia, what do I do? And she would sort of talk them down and, and calm them. And she'd say, well, now you put a little foil on the breast to protect it. And then you you turn it over and you, uh, or if you really want to do it right, you cut the bird up into pieces and you do the dark meat separately from the light meat. Um, but really don't worry about it. Um, uh, you know, if, if you could just do a simple, uh, uh, a few vegetables and some butter, olive oil, salt and pepper, you're good to go. Uh, and she said, don't worry about it, dearie. It'll be, it'll taste just fine. Um, and it was very comforting to people. Uh, and, and um, you know, we always said, uh, you know, Julia, why do you keep your phone number in the book? And she'd say, well, I'd like to talk to people. <laughs> so <laughs> it's true. So speaking about Thanksgiving, uh, Rock has asked us, what is the best way to cook that turkey? High heat first, then lower it. Low heat first. Do you baste it or not? Uh, basically, what is the best way to get the best turkey outcome? Well, I probably have done it five or six different different ways. Uh, one of my best ways to start with, I do an incision uh, between the drumstick and the thigh, a little bit like one inch deep, so that the heat can penetrate there. That's usually where it's it gets to be uncooked or still red with blood, and then the, the breast may end up overcooked. Uh, one of the best way also I have done is to put it uh, on a wire rack in a big stock pot, put three, four tablespoons of water underneath, and, uh, and steam it for like 35, 40, 45 minutes, depending on the size of your turkey. And I can do that the day before. By then, most of the fat you have in the turkey come in those three or four cups of water. So the day after, you can remove the fat from that. And in that water, I cook the, 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 the neck and the giblet and so forth. And that's what I do the sauce with. And then the turkey, I brush it with uh, usually a bit of vinegar and honey. And uh, on high temperature now, because it's partially cooked, but then it goes into the oven, it gets beautifully crisp. And the sauce underneath, I put some carrot, onion, and the, the juice from that uh, that cooking uh, liquid. And uh, it makes one of the best, the Chinese way 
of doing it. Uh, the Chinese do a lot of time uh, uh, steamed chicken and all that before roasting them too. So this is one of the way that I've done it in, forget which book I did, but uh, which came out really good, very, very moist, creamy and, uh, and succulent, yeah. We often um, uh, put the chicken in the fridge a day or uh, the turkey in the fridge a day or two beforehand. Um, we do uh, put some herbs uh, and garlic under the skin, especially on the, on the breast. Uh, and then we salt the skin and we don't cover the turkey. We leave the salt on the skin and that dries it out so that when you roast the turkey, uh, it becomes a beautiful dark brown color and it really crisps up nicely. Um, and um, Julia, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, had a very simple recipe, which was just a couple of vegetables and some butter, um, you know, truss it or not as you wish. But I think if she said, if you really want to do it right, you you do separate the white meat from the dark meat. You cut the bird up, uh, you roast them different because they, they they roast at different temperatures, and they um, uh, and and then you do um, you know something like a chestnut stuffing uh, or an oyster stuffing, you know, to give it that little extra zing. And and then uh, we would do a two or three different types of cranberry. We'd do a chutney. We'd do a, a, a classic sauce. Uh, we do a, a cranberry with orange peel and uh, in it, um, and you know the side dish has become really part of the main event. So, uh, you know, the turkey's a, it's a big bird, um, and it can take up your 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 refrigerator. So you've got to kind of plan ahead a little bit. But um, uh, there's no right, there's no one right way of doing it. But there are sort of refined refinements you, one can make as you as you get more. Uh, experienced. And so I, I try to do it slightly differently every year just to play with it. And I haven't tried Jacques uh, steaming and then roasting, but I'm going to do that. That sounds great. We have a question. Oh, I'm we, sorry. We did it. We did it on, on the show, you know, and at that point, I wasn't going to do it this way. She said, oh, we have to do a turkey. Uh, and I said, OK, fine. And I was going to roast. She said, she said, I want you to burn it out. I said, you think so? So we, of course, we argue about that. And finally, yes, I took the two leg out. I burned out the, the drumstick, uh, the, the, the thigh, the, the uh, you know, the, the big bone in the, in the leg. In the, and uh, we stuff it with uh, a bread stuffing. I think it's some oyster. And we close it and the two breasts, uh, the, the, the whole breast, we, we cook one next to the other separately and uh, end up doing a sauce with, uh, with carrot and onion and garlic and so forth. And it was very good. We had a good time. You're making, you're making me hungry, Jacques. That sounds fabulous. <laughs> so we have a question about stuffing, actually. Uh, would she say that she liked dressing or stuffing better inside or outside the bird? Well, uh, I don't know. I, do, I usually do it uh, outside the bird. I do it separately because it doesn't cook in the same way too. Sometimes it prevents. It depends what you put in your stuffing too. You know, if you put your stuffing with uh, with cornbread and different type of thing, if you don't have a meat, but as soon as you start putting some uh, some sausage meat or whatever in it, you have to be sure that it comes to the right temperature inside. You know, with the meat, and sometimes it's too much for the turkey for the top. So I rather cook it on the side, personally. Yeah, we often do it on the side. Um, but it's not bad cooked in, inside the bird either. I mean, it's, you know, you get the juices, but uh, you have more control over it if it's not cooked outside. We only have a few more minutes. And um, I, I thought this was an interesting question from Elizabeth in Somerville. And uh, she thanks you both for being here and asks, I'm just starting out cooking. And I wonder if you have any tips for somebody who's trying to stop the takeout. Well, no, I mean, there is nothing wrong with takeout. You can do it halfway takeout and finish it up yourself. You know, often people tell me, I don't cook at all. What do you think I should do? I said, well, you have friends who cook. And they said, yes. I said, well, why don't you go next time you go to your friend? I said, can I come an hour ahead and help you in the kitchen? You come with a bottle of wine. And you'd bring the bottle of wine, you know, an hour ahead. And at that point, you don't care whether the chicken is ever <laughs> or not anyway. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think of these uh, these cooking kits as a kind of a nice uh, entree into cooking. If you're afraid of it or you're just un, uncertain about it, uh, because what you do is you get the ingredients and then they give you step-by-step -step instructions. And 
So you're not so worried about, you know, getting the proportions right and you know, getting the ingredients right, because it's all right there. And then once you've done that a few times, um, you know, start looking at recipes and, and shopping and, and uh, setting aside some time if you've got it to, 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 to cook uh, a good meal. And it's, and, you know, Julia always said that it's, it's worth the time and effort to do things right. Um, and who cares about the dishes? It's not really uh, that onerous. And, um, you know, frankly, a home cooked meal is it's, it's empowering. It's, it's, um, it's, you know, her favorite phrase was you've got to work hard, really learn your technique, um, you know, be willing to take risks, make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Uh, uh, but above all, have fun. And this was a, a maxim that she applied to cookery, but I think of it as really, it's, it's a life lesson. Um, you know, work hard, learn your technique, uh, take risks and have fun. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, deceptively simple message that, that's, that's quite empowering. And I would say that's, that's one of the reasons that, that Julia became so popular is that she demystified cooking uh, particularly French cooking, which sounded scary to people, but actually she showed you that, oh, you know, something that's a, a bouffe bourguignon sounds scary. It's actually just a beef stew. It's a, it's a peasant dish. Um, and, uh, there's, there, there, there are various ways of doing it right. Um, and very few ways of doing it wrong. And it's, uh, it's a question of trial and error. And, um, and her favorite thing in the world was to sit around with friends and family and cook and eat together. And, and that's uh, not always possible, but it's really the best way to do it. And there's nothing like having the family gather around the hearth. You know, they maybe we don't cook on the hearth anymore, but life's too short. Yeah, I would just add that that, that children's book that I did, it's not really a children's book. It's, it's for everybody. Uh, and in fact, uh, there's a little biography of Julia in the back that's more aimed at adults, but there's also a Julia recipe uh, for something as, as simple sounding as scrambled eggs, um, which is a dish I picked because it's something that everybody can learn a little bit of technique from. Uh, kids can do it on their own, or you can do it uh, with an adult. Um, and it's a really fun recipe that that is is not just uh, uh, scrambling up some eggs. There's a little bit of technique to it. Um, and so it makes it a fun book to read and and um, and 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 it gives you a little takeaway. We have time for one more question. And uh, Sherry is with us from San Diego, California, and asks, uh, what do you think Julia would have created if she had to do a Thanksgiving show of only vegan creations? Or would she just laugh at the idea? Well, I don't know. But, uh, that, uh, frankly, she liked vegetable. All the, uh, Alex was talking about everything that goes around the turkey, you know, you can have more, many more dishes than you have the turkey itself. And at that point, if I had uh, a choice and I would do all of those different dishes with the turkey, and if you don't want to eat the meat, you don't eat the meat, you eat the, only the vegetable, you know. But uh, I mean, for me, I will have the meat because I'm not a, a vegetarian guy, but frankly, uh, uh, the amount of meat that uh, I eat and people eat now are kind of minimal. Uh, yeah, you you rely much more on the, the garnish, the different vegetable that you have around. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I uh, I've just done this book about presidential food. It's coming out in in February, and uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who's famous for his gardens at Monticello. Uh, was what we now call vegetable forward, which where he would eat uh, large amounts of vegetables and a small amount of protein. Um, you know, in, in his day, everybody ate lots of meat, and but now the 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 culture has come around where we're we're on a Thomas Jefferson diet. Many people uh, being vegetable forward. Uh, Julia uh, was very vegetable friendly, uh, of course, and um, but she was also a carnivore, an enthusiastic carnivore, and. Uh, one of my childhood memories is her picking up a giant drumstick, you know, a Jurassic style <laughs> turkey leg and gnawing on it and just thinking that was the coolest thing. And, um, but um, I, I, you know, uh, we, the, the, our family is famous for big salads and, and things like Brussels sprouts uh, done in creative ways. And I'm not, 
I'm not sure that Julia was a, she was never a vegan, but she was um, uh, very much uh, vegetable forward. Yeah. I love that image of the Jurassic drumstick. And I think that's where we have to leave it. I want to say thank you both. Um, thank you to everybody for tuning in today uh, to our Ask the Expert.